Hi, I'm Kristen here at UT Southwestern Medical Center. Thank you for joining us for our Facebook Live chat with Dr. Vasantha Fasan about colonoscopy and other screening methods for colorectal cancer. And Dr. Fasan is a radiologist with UT Southwestern's Abdominal Imaging Division, and she's, her research interests include gastrointestinal imaging and procedures. Before we start, we'd like to thank the Moncrief Cancer Institute for their support of this very important discussion. And also, don't forget to like and share this conversation as we go along, and be sure to ask questions. And we're happy to have Dr. Fasan here, and she's ready for your questions. And we'll take as many as we can get to in the next 30 minutes. One final reminder, don't forget, we can't address individual patient questions, specifically about you. So we can talk in generalities, but that's due to patient privacy laws. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Sure. Fasan. Yeah. It's a pleasure to have you. Mm -hmm. So let's start with a simple question. I mean, what is colorectal cancer? Sure. Cancer can be begin anywhere in the body, mm -hmm. and colorectal cancer is cancer that begins in the colon, or more commonly, the large bowel. Okay. It, can, it usually begins in the inside of the colon, mm -hmm. so it begins from precancerous growth called polyps. And um, the one thing that is unique to colorectal cancer is that the time it takes for these polyps to actually progress to cancer. Okay. And so that plays to our advantage and it makes colon cancer one of the cancers that are uh, best suited for screening because these polyps um, sometimes take about 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. They are in your body for 10 to 15 years before they actually turn into a cancer. Mm -hmm. And so if you catch them before they become a cancer or even if you catch them in the early phases of cancer before the patient has the symptoms okay. of cancer, then uh, the chances of a cure are very high. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what makes colon cancer a great cancer to be screened. Gotcha, okay. And so what are some risk factors for colorectal? Sure, um, there are some risk factors that are modifiable, mm -hmm. right? And there are some that are not. Um, the ones that you can't do anything about are your genetic factors. Do you okay. have a family history? Do you, you yourself have a history of colon cancer in the past and the chances of developing another one will still be higher. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are some um, other um, uh, diseases such as inflammatory bowel diseases. Gotcha. Um, and there are some uh, polyposis syndromes. These are people who are genetically predisposed to developing multiple polyps in their colon. Okay. And these patients and these subgroups are at a higher risk for developing colon cancer. And there's not much we can do because we're born with these. But then mm -hmm. there are several modifiable risk factors. Mm -hmm. And those would be um, diet, okay. um, eating um, less red meat, less processed meats, mm -hmm. and uh, increasing your fiber intake. Mm -hmm. These are all going to be uh, helpful in preventing. Um, then there is obesity and a sedentary lifestyle, which you can also alter. Mm -hmm. um, and heavy smoking and drinking has also been linked to um, increased risk of colon cancer. Okay. Um, but the simple or the most effective method of preventing colon cancer would be by screening for, okay. for it. And that is part of this discussion. Exactly. Now, how often should somebody be screened for colon cancer? Right. So the general guideline for the average risk patient mm -hmm. is that they begin screening at age 50 okay. and they continue to do that until 75 years. Okay. Um, and based upon, there are several options, but based upon what your options that you pick to use, it's going to be uh, every 10 years for uh, optical colonoscopy mm -hmm. or the standard colonoscopy. If they choose to do a CT colonography, we recommend that they come back every five years. Okay. Now there are some other tests such as um, stool tests, mm -hmm. um, it, where you are looking for either blood in the stool or you're looking for abnormal cells that the cancer might right. have shed. Um, and so those tests are uh, recommended that they get done a little earlier, like every, or more frequently, I should say, every right. year uh, for them. So um, the answer to that is that it depends upon what test you choose as okay. to how often you get uh, screened. And also um, the, um, yeah, I guess that's Okay, it. that's perfect. So we have a couple questions that have started coming in. So this first one is from, from Sheila. She asks, what are the signs that I might have colon cancer? Right, um, so the uh, common signs would be that some vague abdominal pain that uh, okay. that may be going on, 
Um, you, there may be unexpected weight loss. Mm -hmm. um, you could feel fatigue. Um, there, uh, there may be some blood in the stool. Okay. Um, the patient may also ex uh, note that the caliber of their stool has changed. Uh, maybe it becomes more thinner in caliber, and that's because if there was an obstructing mass or a mass okay. partially obstructing in the colon, then the stool as it passes through is going to get thinner, so you start okay. having uh, thinner caliber stools. So these are all some red flags that um, you, that you should go see your doctor. Okay. Now, just because you have abdominal pain doesn't mean that you have cancer, right. but you know, even you have symptoms, make sure you go see your doctor. So get it worked out. It's yeah. worth making that yeah. appointment. Yeah. Okay. So we have we have a follow up question, and it's that we talked about this a little bit, but why if colon cancer can be prevented, why won't people screen? Right. I think um, the problem that some people have, so one of the things is that um, there is uh, the prep itself. You know, when you want to look for the colon cancer you want to clean out the inside of the colon. So the right. stool needs to come out, otherwise you will not be able to see the cancer or mm -hmm. the growth that is developing. So no matter whether you pick optical colonoscopy or virtual colonoscopy, mm -hmm. um, the inside of your colon needs to be cleaned out. Mm -hmm. And so um, for that, the prep is the day before you need to uh, be on a clear liquid diet. Mm -hmm. and, and so some people do not like the the, the prep part of it. Right. And then there are others who are afraid of the uh, maybe having to undergo sedation mm -hmm. for, uh, for an optical colonoscopy. Um, they may not have a ride to drive them back home mm -hmm. because they, this, this for an optical colonoscopy will usually need to take the day off for the test because okay. you received anesthesia and uh, you're sedated, you will not be able to drive back home. So you need to have a friend or a family member drive you back home. So there are logistic uh, causes as right. well right. that may prevent someone from um, undergoing these tests. And so it is our goal that by giving the patient some additional options mm -hmm. that we may increase uh, the, the chances that a person would get screened. Okay, good. So we have another question here and this one is from Susanna and she asks, how effective is a virtual colonoscopy versus a normal colonoscopy? Right. Great question. Right. Um, so a virtual colonoscopy is, um, is very comparable to an optical colonoscopy. So the polyps that we pick up, which are precancerous growths, are, you know, at about a centimeter or so, we are very similar to optical colonoscopy. Now with the very tiny polyps, optical colonoscopy is going to be better than virtual colonoscopy. However, the, I, like we talked about earlier, the time frame that it takes for a polyp to turn into colon cancer is quite long, and the risk of the risk of having colon cancer it depends upon the size of that polyp. So the smaller the polyp, the chances of having cancer in it are very very slim, and we feel at about six millimeters is where we start reckon, are able to pick them up on virtual colonoscopy, and at that level. Um, we will be catching uh, pretty much almost all cancers. Okay. Um, so they are comparable to optical colonoscopy as far as effectiveness. Mm -hmm. Now there are some differences with uh, virtual colonoscopy. If you did find a polyp, mm -hmm. you have to go back. And when I say a polyp, we talk about a polyp greater than a centimeter or several po small polyps, in which case then you will have to go ahead and get a regular colonoscopy to look in and have those polyps removed. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the chances of that happening, however, are actually one in 10. So for every 10 patients who get a regular virtual colonoscopy, mm -hmm. we recommend that they go ahead and get that optical mm -hmm. colonoscopy in only about one of them. And right. so, yeah. So then, um, so for both of those types of colon screenings, do you does, do they need a ride home for both of them, or is there one that they right. just go home by themselves? Very good question, yes. So with virtual colonoscopy, because the, there is no sedation, mm -hmm. there is uh, none involved, the test itself is only about 15 minutes or, or less from the mm -hmm. time that they enter the room and they're out. And then once the test is done, um, they are free to go about their day. Um, okay. They can drive themselves back home they can go back to work, um, and so th that is the advantage of uh, gotcha. having a virtual colonoscopy. Okay, so with these questions, they keep coming in. We've got a lot of questions underway. Here's another one from Sheila. She says, so a CT colonoc 
colonography involves x-ray, is this dangerous? Right, that's a common question that we get. Um, so there is a small amount of radiation involved. Now, how we use what we call as a low dose technique and the amount of radiation that a person would receive for a virtual colonoscopy is less than what you might receive from say a routine CT that a doctor might order for some symptoms that a patient might have. Now to put this into perspective, um, the, um, the amount of radiation that a person gets from virtual colonoscopy is about three millisieverts. Mm -hmm. And what does that mean? So just by living in, we get some background radiation. So we all get exposed to some radiation just by, you know, from whatever is there, the cosmic rays, the radon, the mm -hmm. stuff in the food. Mm -hmm. So there is some radiation that we all get exposed to. And that is on average in the United States. It varies from place to place, but right. over average, it's about three uh, millisieverts. Okay. And so it's per year, per year. So that was the amount you would receive per year. And so basically just by living for a year, mm -hmm. that is the amount of radiation that you're getting. Okay. And also the radiation re changes in some places, like if you live in higher altitudes, mm -hmm. the amount that you might receive is a little bit higher. Mm -hmm. um, f and for the same reason, pilots are known to get a little bit more radiation. And there is no increased risk of cancer in these mm -hmm. patients or courts of people, I should call it. Okay, good to know. So we've got a question here from Gamar, and it, I apologize if I misspelled your name. It asks, what age should you have a colonoscopy? 50. Uh, at age 50 for an average risk person. However, there are some, some um, uh, groups such as uh, if you are a African American or a Latino group, or in patients who have family history mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, um, of, of colon cancer, there is a recommendation that you may want to begin colon cancer screening even mm -hmm. a little bit earlier. Um, and so please do talk to your physician. They will have to make a detailed assessment mm -hmm. of what your risk factor is, and they can recommend that you get a colonoscopy uh, maybe even before age 50. Okay. But in general, for average age patients or average risk patients, we recommend that they start at age 50. Okay, you, may, you mentioned certain groups. Are certain groups more prone to developing colon cancer? Um, yes, uh, I think with at least the African American and the Latino group, as far as I know, it is because they, uh, there is a disparity in how well screening occurs. And okay. so uh, we do um, uh, recommend, and also there is an increased risk of, of them dying from colon cancer once okay. they do get colon cancer and therefore um, the recommendation is to talk you know put all these uh, different factors talk to your doctor mm -hmm. and figure out what is the best time for you okay perfect so we've got some more questions and these are really great keep them coming and uh, you're doing a wonderful job so we've got one here it, you touched on briefly about a virtual colonoscopy how long does one take right so let me explain about how the test itself is mm -hmm. done. Um, so for this test, uh, there are two parts to it, right? Okay. One is the actual preparation for the test, and this begins with the patient, and it is a very important part of the test, because if the colon is not cleaned out, it will hide polyps, it will hide cancers, and mm -hmm. it will be a suboptimal test. So this part of the test, which is the bowel prep, begins the day before, and so the pa patient is asked to have a clear liquid diet and not uh, eat any solid foods, and also to clear the colon of any stool, we give them a combination of laxatives and um, also what we call as stool tagging agents. Mm -hmm. These are agents that will adhere to any small residual stool that may remain in the colon. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at it, um, we are able to differentiate um, what is stool and what is polyp. Mm -hmm. So that is the preparation part of it, and okay. that is important. And then the actual study part of it, which is actually the easy part of it. So once you come in, um, the a technologist will explain to you what the test is and how, you know, what they can ex expect mm -hmm. during the study. And then a small rubber catheter, it's a small tube that goes mm -hmm. into the rectum or the distal most portion of the colon. Okay. And then we, we have to distend the colon because if the colon is collapsed, then we won't be able to see any small growth. So right. the colon needs to be distended and for that, we insufflate it with carbon dioxide, which we use. Um, some places use room here, um, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. And then we also use a uh, automated machine, mm -hmm. which is which was set to automatically turn off if the pressure gets too high. So, okay. 
So that's a safety mechanism, so we're yeah. not that's, uh, you know, causing any side effects by mm -hmm. in inflating uh, or increasing the pressure in the colon. Okay. So then we uh, inflate the colon, and when the colon is adequately distended, mm -hmm. we then get images in two positions, one okay. in with the patient laying on the back and one with the patient laying on the stomach. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of that is if there's any stool um, that would move between the two, then that would mm -hmm. help us differentiate what is a true tube mass growing okay. versus what might be a polyp. Um, and then after that, at each of those positions, the scan is only about 15 seconds. Okay. So it's 15 seconds each position, and then they're done. Now, some patients during the procedure, when the colon is getting distended, can experience a discomfort. discomfort. It is similar to how you might feel, like say if you have to go to the bathroom and you're really full and you have to go feel a little crampy. That's okay. what most people um, describe it as. Okay. It's not anything that needs sedation or severe pain. Okay. So, so is, is this yeah. is this procedure maybe safer for somebody that has other medical issues? Exactly. Yes, there are elderly and frail patients who may not be able to tolerate um, mm -hmm. a regular optical colonoscopy. Um, such patients are definitely candidates for uh, for okay. virtual colonoscopy. And then we also have, especially at UT Southwestern. Uh, where we have a large population of transplant patients mm -hmm. who uh, usually get screened beforehand um, for colon cancer before mm -hmm. they get their transplant. And such patients, because of their cardiac issues or their pulmonary function issues, are deemed not safe for anesthesia. The risk of anesthesia okay. is too high for such patients, and we screen them with virtual colonoscopy. Okay. And then there are also groups of patients who may be on blood thinners, their risk mm -hmm. of bleeding might be higher from a regular colonoscopy. And so there are uh, some groups that would do better with uh, an optical, okay. um, I'm sorry, virtual colonoscopy. Okay, good to know. So just a reminder, we have a little less than 15 minutes left, so keep these questions coming in. We have one here from Kim. She asks, what if you have a very slow moving digestive, digestive system for the prep time? It took hours before it worked. Are all physicians going to this type of virtual procedure? Right. Um, so we, when we schedule a patient for a virtual colonoscopy, we normally talk to the patient and ask them these mm -hmm. questions. And if they indicate that they are chronically maybe prone for constipation, mm -hmm. then we alter the prep a little bit and have them, instead of a one-day prep, we have them take a two-day prep. Okay. And we also tell the patient the day before that if they're still passing a lot of solid stool, then you should call us and speak to us and maybe we should you know, alter or prolong the prep a little bit more mm -hmm. before we go ahead and do this. Okay, so really great question, Kim. We've got another one here from Daniela, and she asks, are there any risks associated with this, with a virtual versus a normal standard colonoscopy? Right, it's almost zero risk. The risk of a colon perforating from a virtual colonoscopy is negligible. Mm -hmm. um, the only, it's not a risk, but the only drawback with virtual colonoscopy is when you see a lesion, mm -hmm. if you see one, you do have to go ahead and re get a regular colonoscopy, colonoscopy to get it taken out. Okay. okay, great question. Thanks for asking. So we have one for from Sierra. She's wondering how long have you been have you been doing virtual colonoscopies? Oh, let me think. About five to six years now, I think. Yes. <gasps> yeah. All right. So you have some experience <laughs> with them. All right, that works. So we've got some more questions in here. Um, let me find this last one. So here's a different one. And this one is from, um, oh, I can't, I can't. I'm not gonna try to pronounce your name, I apologize. How do I decide which screening test is best for me? Okay, the one, the simplest answer is the one that works for you. Okay. If you are not getting your colon screened, it's not going to help you. May, there may be the best screening tests out there, but if you are not getting it done, then it's not working. So um, so you need to talk to your doctor about all these options. There are several options available. But in general, screening tests can be divided into those where you actually visualize the polyps. Mm -hmm. And then those where are more geared towards detecting early cancers. So the stool test that we talked about earlier is more geared towards detecting early cancer. Mm -hmm. um, but both optical colonoscopy and virtual colonoscopy are geared towards not only detecting early cancers, but also detecting those precancerous growths, and so we can get to them before they turn into cancer. Okay, thank you for the question. So here's one from Kevin. Is there any colon prep needed before the virtual co 
colonoscopy that is easier than a traditional colonoscopy or is it the same type of prep? It is pretty similar. Um, however, some patients, uh, we use maxitrate and usually with optical colonoscopy, they have them have uh, the large volume uh, go lightly that they drink. Um, there, some patients prefer uh, the maxitrate uh, to the uh, go lightly. However, overall in general, uh, unfortunately, the prep is going to be pretty similar to that. Okay, yeah. Sorry about that, Kevin. You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to do the prep. So, where are we going in terms of colon cancer screening? Are there new things on the horizon, or is virtual colonoscopy kind of where we're gonna end up being? Well, um, well, with uh, virtual colonoscopy, recently there have been some studies that we have been. Mm -hmm. It's not recent. We've been trying for a while now is to come up with what we call as a minimal prep. Uh, CTC um, and so kind of hope that the uh, the system would electronically subtract this tool mm -hmm. and so maybe the patient would be able to take a less uh, strenuous uh, or taxing uh, prep okay. and so that way and then the digitally subtract the colon from uh, or subtract this tool from the colon and help us see however uh, with these tests, it does decrease your sensitivity. And so it is still not um, um, as, effective. as effective as one where you're completely cleaned out. But that may still be okay for some patients. If you are 75 years old and uh, you are not doing, you know, if you are mm -hmm. ill um, and you've never been screened before, getting that minimal PrEP CTC is still going to be better than not doing anything. Okay, good to know. So we've got some more questions, and we only have about five minutes left. So if you have any last minute questions, be sure to get them in. Here is one from Jackie. Jackie asks, what if the patient has hemorrhoids? Do they need to be treated beforehand, or will they become agitated afterwards? Um, no, there is no need to treat them beforehand. It is a small uh, uh, rubber catheter, and we do use uh, uh, mm -hmm. some lubricating agent. Mm -hmm. Our technologists are, you know, they do this all the time and they will know to be uh, gentle um, mm -hmm. uh, while putting the tube in. Okay. Yeah. No, that seems to be a common problem. Yes, yes it is. All right, so here's another one. Since, um, since virtual colonoscopy is a CT scan, do you see anything else on these scans? Great question. Yes. And that is another advantage of, uh, uh, of the virtual colonoscopy because mm -hmm. not only are we looking at the inside of your colon, but mm -hmm. we can look on the outside of your colon. Mm -hmm. um, and so we oftentimes, I wouldn't say oftentimes, but we also pick up other cancers mm -hmm. sometimes. Um, it happens about two to three percent of the times we actually picking up other um, uh, medically important conditions. Uh, most of the common cancers that we tend to pick up would be either renal cancer mm -hmm. or lymphoma. Um, we pick up other conditions such as uh, an abdominal aortic aneurysm. Mm -hmm. So it's an abnormal dilatation of the main blood vessel in your body mm -hmm. and that is a ticking time bomb. You don't have any symptoms and if it ruptures, there's a very high risk of death. And so wow. um, we do pick up these non-suspecting other mm -hmm. medical conditions that may be lurking. Interesting. So, great, great question. Here's one from Anna, and this is this is interesting. Should someone get this virtual option earlier than they would the standard colonoscopy? Sure. If you do have some risk factors that we talked about earlier, mm -hmm. um, then there is definitely a recommendation, especially if there is a family member in a first degree relative mm -hmm. who had a colon cancer, then uh, the recommendation is that you get it done 10 years before that person at whatever age started getting symptoms or was diagnosed. So um, there is um, a push to you know develop or, or get your colon um, screened earlier, maybe mm -hmm. starting at age 40 for some patients. Mm -hmm. um, so, but you would have to discuss that with your doctor. Okay, okay, good question. Thanks for asking it, Anna. So here's, I think this is going to be one of our last questions, but this is one that often comes up in more chats. Is this test covered by my insurance? Yes, great question. Once again, um, virtual colonoscopy will be covered by all private paying insurances. It is covered by the, based, based on the Affordable Care um, Act. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. It is now, uh, it mandates all uh, insurances, private paying insurances to okay. cover virtual colonoscopy. They shouldn't have any out-of-pocket expenses. Okay. However, 
uh, it is yet to be covered by Medicare. So if you are by Medicare, um, this will not cover for what we call a screening virtual colonoscopy. However, there are some specific conditions that Medicare will allow um, to be paid and to get okay. a virtual colonoscopy. And those conditions would be that you did have a regular colonoscopy, but okay. it was incomplete. They were not able to go through it completely, and so they are then referred to us to get a virtual colonoscopy. Okay. Or, like we talked about earlier, that they have some risk factors, either blood bleeding disorders, mm -hmm. or that their cardiac and pulmonary status prevents them from getting sedation. Okay. And so such patients, if they came in and got a virtual colonoscopy, uh, it would be covered by me. Okay, good to know. So we've got time for two more questions. One of them is, We've touched on this a couple times, but how frequently do I need to have a virtual colonoscopy? And is it on the same schedule as a regular colonoscopy? Okay. Or standard? Correct. So for a standard, it's every 10 years. Mm -hmm. uh, however, for a virtual colonoscopy, because we uh, pick up these polyps at a slightly larger mm -hmm. size, we recommend that they come back every five years. That's okay. the interval that we recommend. So a little less prep time, a little less invasive, you have to come more often. More often. Okay. However, there is also a good number of patients who get a regular colonoscopy, they find a polyp, and then they're put on a three-year three follow-up. So, okay. yeah, okay. it depends upon what they find. Okay, very good. So, how do I schedule an appointment with you? Um, you can call 645-X-RAY, uh, and then uh, we can uh, get you in. And I think you okay. have a number as well. To I do, it. yes. Yeah. We have a question here, and if you want to schedule an appointment, you want to call our patient physician referral service at 214-645-8300. You can also request an appointment online, is my understanding. Okay. And you can come see Dr. Dr. Prasad yourself. So I think what we're gonna do is we are closing out. We have time for maybe one last question, but before we take that last question, I wanna ask, do you have anything, I mean, what do you tell people about the importance of colorectal cancer screening? Right. Um, colon cancer is one of the most preventable cancers, and getting your colon screened is going to be the best way to do it. It doesn't matter what you pick, pick the test that works for you, but there are several options. Talk to your doctor about them. Okay, there you go. You know, I think that's actually the best way we can possibly end this chat. So thank we're going to go ahead and close out the day. I want to thank you very much for joining us. You know, thank you for all of the wonderful questions. This chat will be available here on Facebook, and it'll also be on our YouTube channel later this afternoon. So if you have friends who aren't on Facebook that want you want to share this message, be sure to share there. We will post it afterwards where you can find the link. In the meantime, we really appreciate your time, and thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me.